Hey there, it's Heather with Popular Crime. Welcome back to our channel, and if you are new here, welcome. Happy Mischief Night if you celebrate it, and happy Halloween Eve. Tonight, we are looking into the Martha Moxley case. So it was 1975, the night before Halloween, when the air was crisp and something seemed to lurk in the darkness. And while this might just be the effect of one too many horror movies for the majority of us, for the Moxley family, this evil would soon take hold of their reality in the most horrific way possible. Martha Elizabeth Moxley was born on the 16th of August in 1960 to Dorothy and David Moxley. Martha had a normal childhood for the most part, and the Moxley family lived in Piedmont, California for most of her childhood. Just 18 months prior to her death, her father moved the family to Bell Haven in Greenwich, right on the Connecticut coast in Fairfield County. Now, Bell Haven is one of the richest communities in Connecticut, and it certainly looks the part. It has grand mansions, manicured lawns, even an exclusive country club to entertain its wealthy residents. While Martha's father worked at a large accounting firm, her mother took good care of Martha and her brother John as a stay-at-home mom. Now, most teenagers would find it difficult to fit in at a new school, but Martha adapted quickly. She was a sophomore when they moved, and she took it upon herself to make as many friends as possible, and she also tried out for the cheerleading squad. In fact, just months before her death, her classmates had deemed her the girl with the best personality. She was also a straight A student and had joined the school's basketball team. On the night of October 30th, 1975, Martha went out to join her friends for mischief night. She had been grounded that night, but her mother didn't want her to feel left out of all the fun. So she was allowed to go out for that night. Now mischief night was a tradition among the neighborhood kids. They would play harmless pranks on the residents like ding dong ditch, or unrolling a bunch of toilet paper onto their yards, their trees, bushes, stuff like that. For the most part, it was just all harmless fun for the kids in this upper class elite neighborhood. That night though, things would go awry. Martha was last seen in the company of Tommy Skakel and a few of her friends later stated that they appeared to be flirting. It's hard to pin down the relationship between Martha and Tommy and like many details of this case we'll never really know, However, from excerpts of Martha's diary, we get an idea of their mutual interest. Martha had taken a friend with her to go to the Skakel house where Tommy and Michael and their siblings lived with their father, Rushton Skakel, and several staff members, including a tutor and a maid. Their mother, Ann Skakel, had died in 1973 due to cancer, after which their father's alcoholism got progressively worse. Now, unlike the Moxley household, there was nobody taking charge of the Skakel children, despite them having a dedicated household staff for this very purpose. Michael described it in an unsold book proposal as an intense level of chaos came to rule their house. Russian would leave the children under the supervision of the household staff, who could not seem to control them. And as for money, they seemed to have a never-ending supply of it. The Skakels were loaded. Many accounts of this case highlight their more famous cousins, the Kennedy family, but the Skakel family were said to have more wealth than the Kennedys when Rushton's sister, Ethel, married Bobby Kennedy in 1950. More importantly then, the Skakel wealth came from legitimate businesses, whereas the Kennedys' fortune allegedly came from bootlegging during Prohibition. Michael Skakel would later state that Chronic illness, alcoholism, a repressive Catholic moral and sexual outlook, along with systemic dysfunction at times surfacing as extreme pathology, lurked in the shadows of the Skakel household. He also later stated that he was often beaten by his father and his older brother Tommy. Now, the Skakel kids were infamous in the neighborhood for being unruly and disrespectful to a point where the staff employed at their house would often quit their positions after only working there for a few months. Dorothy Moxley would later state that she didn't know how Martha had befriended the Skakel boys or even that she had befriended them. Michael Skakel in particular was notorious. At 13, Michael started stealing from his father's liquor cabinet and began what he described as full-blown daily drinking. Despite this, 
The Skakel family's wealth and reputation overshadowed their negative behavioral traits, and the kids were always surrounded by a group of friends, which included Martha. In her diary, Martha recounted several instances where their group of friends engaged in unruly behavior, with one instance in particular talking about how they had taken Tommy's car out for a drive. Tommy had let her steer the car, but she had to sit on his lap in order to do it. She had also written that he held her by her waist and that his actions made her uncomfortable. She also wrote about how Michael, who had initially had a crush on her, was now being rude toward her. It appeared as though Michael and Tommy were competing for Martha's affection and that they were both failing. In another eerie journal entry, Martha wrote that she needed to stop going over there, meaning the Skakel house. On the night of October 30th, 1975, Martha and her group of friends decided to throw eggs, toilet paper, and shaving cream around the neighborhood before making a stop at the Skakel house. Now, the timeline is murky. Both Tommy and Michael gave investigators an assortment of times, places, and people they were with on that night, so we really don't know with certainty when the events occurred, but we do know that as she waited for her daughter to come home, Dorothy Moxley grew worried. Even in this safe neighborhood, Dorothy would stay up late if one of her children were out, and that night was no different. As night turned into morning, Dorothy felt even more uneasy and tried to get in contact with Martha's friends. But no one had seen her. No one knew where she was. Shayla McGuire, one of Martha's closest friends, had said she was probably at the Skakel house. This, combined with the close proximity of the Skakel and Moxley homes, caused Dorothy to worry even more because it was after dawn and Martha was still not home. She ultimately decided to take matters into her own hands and headed over to the Skakel house. Now, according to reports, Michael Skakel answered the door and told Dorothy something she would never forget. He told her that he had no idea where Martha was. She then asked him if she could go with him to check out the trailer that was parked in the Skakel's driveway, and Michael agreed. They checked the trailer, found it empty, and then Dorothy left for her friend Jean's house, which was just down the road. By this time, Sheila began walking around the neighborhood in search of Martha. She went to the Skakel's backyard to look for her since it was the last place she had seen her, but she was unable to find Martha or any sign of her there either. She then decided to cross over into the Moxley's backyard to continue looking for her. And it was here under a large pine tree that Sheila found Martha. She was lying face down at the foot of the tree. This sent Sheila into a state of dread, and according to her statements at the time, she panicked and ran. Soon after, officers arrived at the scene. What they found was a horror beyond anything they had ever expected. Martha had been found face down with her pants pulled down to her ankles. She had sustained several severe injuries, including multiple blunt force trauma injuries to the head, and there was part of what appeared to be a golf club still stuck in her neck. Her attacker had swung the club at her with so much force that the club shattered into four parts, one of which was then likely used to stab her. One of the four pieces of the club, the grip, was not found at the scene of the crime. In fact, despite numerous rumors about its whereabouts, the grip has never been recovered. Investigators also discovered that while her pants and underwear were pulled down, Martha had not been sexually assaulted. Investigators also found a trail of blood leading from the Moxley family house to the backyard where Martha's remains had ultimately been discovered. This meant that she had likely been attacked in her own driveway and her assailant had dragged her more than 60 feet to where Sheila found her. Investigators traced the golf club back to a set that had been owned by Ann Skakel prior to her death. Now, this led to a lot of fingers being pointed at the Skakels, but of course the family, led by Rushton, denied they had anything to do with the crime. Investigators conducted over a hundred interviews, but they were unable to bring formal charges against anyone. You see, things like this didn't happen in Belhaven, and this was the first murder investigation in 30 years, and the Greenwich police were said to have made many errors very early on. Despite some leads, neither of the investigators' primary suspects were charged and the case grew cold. 
Suspect one was Tommy Skakel. He told police that he last saw Martha at around 9.30 that night when she decided to head home. After this, he said he went to watch the French Connection with the Skakel's live-in tutor, Kenneth Littleton. He stated that after the movie, he went to his room to work on a report on Abraham Lincoln for school. There were, however, several inconsistencies in his statement. For starters, Littleton told police it was more like 10.30 when Tommy came home that night. Likewise, Tommy's teacher denied ever assigning a paper on Abraham Lincoln. This time gap made Tommy seem suspicious, although he was later administered a polygraph test and he passed it. Ken Littleton was also questioned extensively, not just immediately after the crime, but for years and years after it. He denied even knowing who Martha was. He had only started his job as a live-in tutor the night of the murder. Early in the investigation, at least one resident had pointed a finger of accusation at Littleton. Even so, police never brought charges, despite a few failed polygraphs. Years later, a new suspect emerged. In 1991, a rumor began circulating that another Kennedy cousin, William Kennedy Smith, had been at the Skakel household on the night of Martha's murder. In many tabloid-driven cases, speculation and innuendo substitute for facts in the rush to get a story. William Kennedy Smith was on trial, accused of rape, and that was enough to get people whispering that maybe he had killed Martha. But it was just gossip. Not a bit of it was true. He wasn't there and he didn't do it. But it was enough to spark the curiosity of two people about the 16-year-old unsolved case. The first person was Rushton Skakel. He decided to take matters into his own hands to clear his family's name. So he hired the Sutton Associates to re-examine the case, but this ultimately backfired when the private investigators uncovered that both Tommy and Michael had altered their alibis on the night of the murder. The report absolved Tommy, but the conclusion prompted Rushton to bury it. The investigators thought Michael was good for it. So let's go back to look at Michael's statements in 1975. When questioned, Michael Skakel told investigators that he had left the house at around 9.15 that night and went over to his cousin's place to watch a Monty Python movie before returning around 11 o'clock. His cousin, however, did not corroborate Michael's claim, which led to his changing his alibi several times over the course of the investigation. He even claimed that he was masturbating in a tree outside of Martha's window when the murder occurred, and that he had heard a noise which had apparently scared him off. A later version of the story had him in the tree that Martha was found under. Now, Michael was a troubled kid, as we mentioned earlier. He drank daily from his early teens. And when he was arrested for drunk driving in 1978, his father cut a deal with authorities for Michael to attend the Elon School, which was an institution for troubled youth to avoid being sent to prison. It was at Elon that Michael made several damaging statements about the case, but we'll get to them in a minute. The second person who started digging into the case following the trial of William Kennedy Smith was Dominic Dunn. Dunn was a legend in the true crime community as he spent years writing on the way the wealthy and privileged interacted with the justice system. This was prompted by the murder of his daughter, actress Dominique Dunn, in 1982. After covering the Kennedy Smith trial, Dunn began researching and released A Season in Purgatory, which was based on Martha's murder. Afterwards, he encouraged Mark Furman to investigate the case. Dunn also shared a copy of the Sutton report that Rush Skakel had commissioned and attempted to suppress with Furman. Though Furman resigned in disgrace as an LAPD detective following his testimony in the O.J. Simpson trial, Dunn regarded him as one of the best detectives in the country. The Greenwich Police Department did not welcome Furman's involvement in the least. He started compiling data on the case for a book called Murder in Greenwich, which he stated he would name the killer. According to Furman, Greenwich police mishandled the case since they had not conducted a murder investigation in over 30 years. When he released Murder in Greenwich, Mark publicly named Michael Skakel as the main suspect in Martha's murder. 
Another book titled Green Town was published by Timothy Dumas. Now, Timothy grew up in the area and also hinted toward the involvement of one of the Skakel brothers. Due in part to these independent investigations into the case and the publicity they generated, Michael Skakel was indicted in 2000, nearly 25 years after the crime was committed. Now, Andy Pugh, who was one of Michael's childhood friends, testified at a preliminary hearing in 2000, detailing a phone chat that he had with Michael in 1991. According to Andy, when he questioned Michael about his whereabouts during the murder, Michael denied murdering her, but admitted to masturbating in a tree the night Martha died. According to the New York Times, the tree Michael had described to Andy was not outside Martha's window, but rather just above where her remains were found. In addition to Pew, Skakel's classmates from Elon also testified against him. Two former Elon school students claimed that they overheard Michael admit to murdering Martha. Gregory Coleman, one of the students, later stated that Michael had been given special privileges and boasted, quote, I'm going to get away with murder. I'm a Kennedy, end quote. In 2001, Coleman died as a result of a drug overdose. Prior to his death, he acknowledged in court that he was actually high on heroin when he testified. Another classmate of Michael's, Elizabeth Arnold, later stated that Michael was furious because he thought his brother had stolen his girlfriend. On May 4, 2002, Michael Skakel's trial began and it lasted for just over a month. He was represented by Michael Sherman, who had gained notoriety appearing on television to discuss noteworthy cases. Despite an estimated $1.5 million spent on his defense, on June 7, 2002, Michael was found guilty of murder and sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. Now, Michael's team appealed his conviction several times, the first appeal being in 2003. It was presented on the grounds that the case was heard in a superior court when it was supposed to have been held in a juvenile court. This appeal was unsuccessful. Another unsuccessful attempt was made in 2007 when a request for a new trial was denied. Michael then appealed one more time in April of 2013 when he stated his defense attorney was incompetent and had used the case for publicity instead of focusing on his defense. Now, Michael was granted a new trial on the 23rd of October in 2013 by Connecticut Judge Thomas A. Bishop, who determined that Sherman failed to effectively defend Skakel when he was convicted in 2002. However, the Connecticut Supreme Court upheld Michael's murder conviction in December of 2016 with a 4-3 to three majority ruling noting that his conviction was the result of overwhelming evidence provided by prosecutors and that his legal counsel had, in fact, been competent. In 2016, a book by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. brought public interest to the case once more. He stated, quote, "...almost nothing that the public knows about this case was true." I think it would be impossible to read this book and still believe Michael is guilty, end quote. The book was titled Framed, Why Michael Skakel Spent Over a Decade in Prison for a Murder He Didn't Commit. And in it, Robert argued that it was two strangers from New York who had been responsible for the murder. This book was slammed by authorities who stated that the claims made in it were unsubstantiated and baseless. Michael's upheld conviction was ultimately reversed by the Connecticut Supreme Court in 2018, and a new trial was ordered. The court reasoned that Michael Sherman's failure to contact an alibi witness, whose name Michael submitted, resulted in ineffective counsel. Connecticut prosecutors announced on the 30th of October, 2020, 45 years to the day that Martha Moxley lost her life, they would not seek to retry Michael Skakel. Now, a lot of newspaper articles and blog posts on this case refer to Michael as the Kennedy cousin, while not even mentioning Martha Moxley in the headline at all. Ultimately, this is one of those cases where power and money mask the actual crime itself. What we need to take away from this case is that justice for Martha Moxley is far from being served. But that is going to do it for today. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget to hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of our uploads. And as always, stay safe, keep investigating, and we'll see you soon.